Auckland, August 7th. A crowd of 47,000 at Eden Park. It's 7.30 p.m. Struck it well, struck it beautifully. 18 kilometres away, flight NZ-864 touches down from Sydney. The passengers are taken to an isolation hotel, but somehow COVID escaped and quietly spreads among us. New Zealand will move to alert level four from 11.59 p.m. tonight. An extraordinary response to three words. The Delta variant. The Delta variant. The Delta variant. The Delta variant. Delta has been called a game changer. Delta in the community is like dealing with a whole new virus. 2021's deadly new twist on COVID-19 is here. I have such mild symptoms, I wouldn't have even called the doctor. Can we eliminate it again? I didn't think I was going to make it. Is another dangerous variant lurking just around the corner? We could see worse than Delta yet. How do we protect ourselves from the disastrous consequences seen overseas? We have the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every three days. And will we one day have to face up to some hard truths? Every time uh, there's been a call to, to me to say we have a case, it, it feels like a massive kick in the guts. It's two weeks tonight since New Zealand was plunged into its second level four lockdown. The arrival of Delta, a rude awakening, a wake up call for a nation that was perhaps a little too comfortable in its COVID free status. In just one week, the outbreak grew from one case to hundreds. There's now so many people with Delta, a second quarantine facility has had to be set up. So how did the virus get out? And how did we end up with a real cluster on our hands? Tuesday afternoon in Devonport. Life interrupted. Breaking news on a new community case of COVID-19. One cough or a sneeze away from a disaster, that's it. I thought this would never happen again. At 6pm, everything changes. New Zealand will move to alert level four. It's Delta lockdown day. By Wednesday, there are 10 cases. By Thursday, 21 in more than 100 locations of interest. This was nothing. It kept going. It is an outbreak. Hi, I'm Morgan, and I'm a 22-year-old business student at AUT. This is Morgan. She lives in Auckland with her parents, has a part-time job, is in her final year of study, and she is in quarantine. I have caught the COVID-19 Delta variant. How have you felt? I've had a few fevers here and there. Um, my throat has definitely been a bit scratchy, but quite a tight chest. Fortunately for me, it's been manageable. Um, but I do hear all the coughing around me and um, the, my neighbouring rooms, and I'm seeing the ambulances come in and out of Jet Park. But how did Delta get out? Was it when it landed here on that Air New Zealand flight and came across the border? Or was it when the index case went into managed isolation at the Crown Plaza Hotel? Or when they went into quarantine out at the Jet Park? Tonight, we can reveal the official search has narrowed to just one of those options, the Crown Plaza Hotel. What we haven't been able to find out and confirm specifically is exactly how the virus jumped from the hotel into the community. Where do you think you got it? AUT campus. Six days before lockdown, she was in the library day and night. That's where you think you probably got it, isn't it? Yeah, as far as I can, you know, think back, um, most likely. Delta was spreading at AUT for almost a week before anybody knew of the Devonport trading. In fact, it was spreading right through downtown Auckland, all around the Crown Plaza. And Morgan, who had caught it, felt absolutely nothing. She carried on with a night out on Friday the 13th at Bar Ting Ting. Health officials say her infectious phase had not begun, but that same night infectious cases were out, including at Bar 101. Morgan was infectious by Saturday. I had a little get together at my house, so I had a few friends over. And on Sunday, Delta went to church, five of them, including the Samoan Assembly of God, a combined service. In lockdown, Morgan still felt nothing, 
but with AUT, a location of interest, she went for a test. I remember just kind of needing a moment to just kind of fathom what is what was going on. Do you know if you've infected anyone? I do have a friend that um, joined me at Jet Park. Yeah, it was a massive shock. I was quite unwell, like chest pains, um, shortness of breath. Her friend, Ty Gowan, was hit much harder. It's no joke, man. Like, it's really, really no joke. Like, even though I'm not in a hospital bed with a ventilator, the first six days was scary, you know, like having to hang up phone calls because you run out of breath and having to get heart scans because my chest is so sore. Do you think you've infected people that you don't know about? I mean, look, there's definitely the risk. I don't really want to think about it that way. Um, I hope not. <laughs> There are now seven clusters. They all start at the Crown Plaza, the source cluster of four people. That's the index case and the family of three in the room next to him that he infected in his roughly 36 hours at the hotel. Then there's the missing link. Then the second biggest cluster involves the Devonport tradie and the Birkdale flat. That's linked to another cluster at AUT. But by far the biggest is the Assembly of God cluster. Judith Toliafoa is a worshipper and daughter of the church's leader. It's roughly around 500 plus, 27 churches, all in this one building. A lot of singing, a lot of performing, a lot of dancing. Delta was in here. That's crazy. We never knew anything about it. I'm very worried. I'm very worried. Hip-hop legend and Dawn Raid music founder Brother D is working closely with up to 800 people impacted in some way. And he blames many of the new cases in lockdown on delays getting them to quarantine. Please, please, <coughs> hurry. <laughs> hurry and get our families in there. They need to be um, quarantined away so um, the other families aren't affected, other family members are not affected. The very reality of that is uh, this could, could cause a death. The jet park is full. Well over 100 people connected to the church are there. For many, English is their second language. Simon Matify is translating, trying to calm the sick and fever. He knows what it's like. He beat COVID himself last year. Who survives COVID and then comes back to the source of COVID? <laughs> well, I've come back here to give back because if the Lord allowed me to overcome the virus that time last year, whatever little I can do to help these people also, that means a lot to me. So the jet park full, the Crown Plaza closed, and the missing link still out there. There's something dangerously different about Delta. It's more contagious. It comes down to the spike proteins, the other bits that stick out the side of the virus cell. With Delta, the spike proteins have mutated, becoming supercharged in their ability to attach to human cells. One US expert put it this way, if the first variant is like syrup, Delta is like Gorilla Glue. With previous strains, one person would infect two others, but with Delta, it's more than twice that. One person may infect five or six others, and it really can be as simple as walking past someone. People infected with Delta are more likely to end up in hospital. They start showing symptoms sooner, but can infect others sooner too. They can even pass on the virus before showing any signs of having it themselves. As Delta spread around the world from India, we watched on from a safe place. But did we do enough to prepare for its inevitable arrival in New Zealand? Were we ready or not? The virus and our health system. Like the villain and the hero of a Hollywood movie. Delta creates havoc. The system and its workforce fight back. We're not fine. We're not OK. The Director General of Health, Dr Ashley Bloomfield, has said things are tough because Delta has thrown a few curveballs. Combating Delta in the community is like dealing with a whole new virus. This, of course, is not a new virus, and this outbreak should not surprise anyone. The so-called curveballs are what Delta has delivered since it first showed up in December. For months, we've seen it spiral out of control. An outbreak here was inevitable. 
it was predictable. And for months, our officials have reassured the public that we'd be ready. But when it hit, it quickly became clear we weren't. Four days before the outbreak, the Health Ministry told NewsHub scenario planning exercises began in December 2020. Auckland Regional Public Health said it had a fully staffed COVID response unit, plus surge staff. So why then, just one week later, were hundreds of extra contact tracers urgently recruited? One would hope that you wouldn't have to be advertising for uh, new staff in the middle of the outbreak. It's meant to work like this. COVID cases and their close contacts get a text or a call. They need to fill out a daily survey on whether they have symptoms. But the system has problems. One person we've spoken to received a text at 10 in the morning saying the survey was in their email inbox. Six hours later, a reminder text arrives, but there's still no survey. They phoned Healthline, waiting at least 25 minutes to do it over the phone instead. Finally, the survey arrived that night. It happened three days in a row. When you look back on New Zealand's coronavirus experience, limited capacity is a reoccurring theme. During the August 2020 outbreak, the COVID response minister said this. I can say the contact tracing uh, systems are not only holding up, they are performing um, as well, of if, if not better, uh, than we expected them to. But official information reveals the reality. Authorities were too slow to respond and worked unsustainable long hours. Fast forward to Auckland's February outbreak, concerns about limited resources were flagged almost immediately. Public health staff were at risk of burnout when managing just 12 community cases. It's a significant problem. You can't afford to play around with a COVID outbreak. Last August, Hill and his team revealed a problem in our public health system. We found that they'd been battling constantly over their finances. At that point, Auckland Public Health got extra COVID funding, about $7 million. To you and I, that might seem like a lot of money, but for people in the know, it was just a drop in the bucket, a dangerous gamble. It was like someone was deciding to throw a dice and convince themselves and everyone else that it was always going to land on a one or a two, that we were never going to have a large outbreak. On the front line of this deadly virus are the nurses. Exhaustion is something this Wellington Hospital nurse knows about. She's also felt unsafe on the job. Recently, she was sick and awaiting a COVID test result, but was told to come to work anyway. Upsetting, and it didn't make me feel like I was safe um, in the hands of the DHB. We asked the ministry about this scenario and they said anyone with symptoms of COVID-19 should get a test and self-isolate until the test result is back. But this nurse says DHB bosses thought otherwise. They had told me that I was a low risk of having COVID, so I should just come into work. Did you feel pressured? Uh, I felt like I was obliged to go to work. Um, and yes, pressured to go to work. At the end of the day, the buck stops with a man who's been trying to steer the country through this pandemic, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield. Well, Dr. Bloomfield, were we ready for Delta? Well, it's fair to say we were well on the way to being ready. We haven't known about Delta for that long. It's really only been with us for the last three months or so. It's uh, a new variant that's emerged rapidly, and so our knowledge was still emergent, and still we're gathering knowledge even as we go through this outbreak in Auckland. Could we have been better prepared? Well, I would say we were, we were well prepared, uh, and of course you never know quite when you're going to get an incursion across the border of the virus. If we had had another month, we would have been able to have do, done more. Well, we've now got dozens of people in hospital with Delta. Can our hospitals actually cope with an outbreak like this? One of the main reasons we've taken an elimination approach to COVID-19 in New Zealand is because we know if it gets away in the community that our health system would be overwhelmed and it doesn't matter how well resourced your health system is, eventually you have too many people in hospital and in ICU to be able to take more admissions. But we're two weeks into this, how do we still not know how Delta got into the community? 
Well, we've looked at pretty much every lead we could, and that included whether any, it had sort of hitched a ride with any of the workers. Their tests have all come back negative. We've uh, looked at the six people who CCTV footage showed were in the atrium area at the time that this index case was being transferred in. They've all returned negative tests. So all the alleys we've gone down so far have proven blind. Are you 100% confident that we can eliminate it again? Oh, look, I'm very confident that if we apply all the measures that Alert Level 4 has as part of it, we will get around this outbreak. I'm sure I speak for everyone when I ask, will there ever be an end to this pandemic? There will be an end to the pandemic as we know it now. It's not going to be in the near future, so we've got to really... Um, you know, think about how we, we uh, dig in for a, for a period of time, and that might be two or three years. Coming up... I didn't think I was going to make it. Australia's Delta disaster... It frankly led to the spread across Sydney, across the rest of New South Wales, across the Tasman to our friends in New Zealand. What happens when you don't move fast enough and what threats lurk on the horizon? We could see variants that are more deadly and more transmissible. The Trans-Tasman bubble reopened in April to tears and jubilation, but Delta put a pin to it. The bubble popped just 14 weeks later as the variant took hold across the ditch. Delta has been a disaster for New South Wales with more than a thousand cases a day. A disaster which has ultimately put us where we are today. I'm not doing too well at the moment, but today I went really bad. The raw, brutal reality of the Delta variant. Please take care of yourselves. It's not something, it's not a game. It's for, it's for real. Sydney is suffering, it's losing the war. Another person dies from it every day. Many deteriorate so fast, they don't even make it to hospital. It is scary going to work each day. Kiwi Jessie Fraser from Kuro is a paramedic on the front line. I haven't seen my parents in a couple of months. Uh, I'm unable to come home to New Zealand to see my family over there, who I haven't seen in a couple of years. With more than 1,000 new cases some days, Sydney hospitals are overwhelmed by people in need of care. Quite often, we don't have a bed available. We feel like we're at breaking point at the moment. 76 days ago, life in Australia's largest city was, in pandemic terms, normal. Then on June 16, FedEx Flight 77 landed, changing the course of Australia's pandemic response. The infected cabin crew's unvaccinated limo driver became case zero. You don't mess with this virus. Mary Louise McClaws is an epidemiologist who advises the World Health Organization. When we had six cases, I had suggested publicly that we go into lockdown, that one case was far too many. State Premier Gladys Berejiklian was desperate to avoid a lockdown. She put her trust in what she called gold star contact tracing. We've always said, and we've considered all the options, but we've always said we won't burden our citizens unless we absolutely have to. It was a fatal mistake. Ten days into the outbreak, 58 cases, and the lockdown call was made. But it was nothing like New Zealand's level four. New Zealand has always done that very sensibly. See, in New South Wales, it's always been lightly, lightly. Perhaps this was what the Premier feared. The anti-lockdown, anti-mask, anti-vax, anti-COVID movement, who defied her orders anyway and roared onto the streets. Like everywhere, this is the only way out. But Australia backed the wrong vaccine. Homemade AstraZeneca, manufactured in Melbourne, hailed as the people's vaccine. Fears of deadly blood clots have left the vaccine strategy in tatters. The Australian government um, failed. The government decided to put all its eggs in the AstraZeneca basket. Former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd says that, and undermining the Delta strain, ultimately put two countries at risk. The failure of the New South Wales state government locked down early and frankly led to the spread across Sydney, across the rest of New South Wales, across the Tasman to our friends in New Zealand. Australia's path out is now tough, 
They've accepted they have to live with the virus. And once 80% of its population is vaccinated, lockdowns will end. They still plan to quarantine and test clusters, but the country is divided. Freedom Day comes in just a couple of months, and cases here in Sydney haven't peaked. Many believe that right now, freedom is too dangerous. That is our goal, to live with this virus, not to live in fear of it. Right now, they're face to face with the enemy. It is always darkest before the dawn. Against the odds, what little vaccine coverage they have is saving lives. You know, they didn't think I was going to make it. With no visitors allowed, 70-year-old Tina Cassaniti is recovering alone. Her relatives waited 22 days for the news that she woke up from a coma. I just can't believe it that I'm here, that I'm alive. You know, it's, it's a miracle. Her message to anyone who will listen is simple. Please just take the vaccine, go and have the infections to save your lives. COVID-19 is rewriting what we thought we knew about viruses. It took the World Health Organization more than a year to declare that the virus could be airborne. And that's why this time under alert level four, we have to wear masks to the supermarket. Is that something we should get used to in a Delta world? I would expect that we'll see um, certainly masks being mandatory at other alert levels, depending on what kinds of, I guess, COVID in the community we might have in the future, we may well end up seeing, you know, a mandatory thing or at least more common uh, in uh, events where lots of people gather together. The masks certainly aren't created equal, although there's very good evidence that a mask is better than no mask. So what's really important is that you don't use a vented mask. If you are infectious, then they will release your virus particles into the environment. Most effective masks are N95s, but really the important thing is to wear um, something, and a cloth or surgical mask will be fine. But are there other protections we should be looking at too? How do we ensure we are only breathing clean air inside? One of today's cases. COVID has had more airtime than any other topic in the last two years. COVID-19 can spread through the air. The virus spread between two groups when their doors opened at the same time. With Delta, infected air is the villain. But vaccines are not the only superhero in this story. There's a sidekick. Ventilation. Well, if we're ready for a ventilation revolution, you can sign me up. Better ventilation might have saved the lives of thousands around the world if we'd recognized the risk. Its potential as an aerosol transmitter was something that we needed to be concerned with earlier. The way to prevent airborne spread is bringing fresh air from outside in and frequently. A typical home, you might be able to only change out the you know, entire air of your building like once every two or three hours. What we would like to see is much higher than that, maybe somewhere that's around five times per single hour. An air purifying system with HEPA filters would do the trick at home. There are a couple hundred dollars, but there's a free solution to improving our inside air right now. The easiest way to improve ventilation is by simply opening a window. Opening them at opposite ends of a building can reduce the risk of infection by particles by 70%. That's not an option, though, in some buildings, like the high-rise student accommodation block caught up in the latest Auckland outbreak. The windows simply don't open. This is an example of a carbon dioxide monitor. But for around $200, you can get a device which monitors how much of the air in the room has been breathed out by other people around you. Outside, fresh air reads around 450. Any carbon dioxide reading above 1,000 inside would cause concern. You typically see this in um, areas like a cafe or a school um, or an office building. And it's readings like these that could become crucial for workplaces in the future. If we can't get a handle on the virus, businesses can get more purified air in or move more people out. You can look at reducing the occupancy. So look at reducing the number of people in that space because we're the ones that emit these aerosols. Then there's the problem of sweaty dance floors like Auckland's Bar 101. 
In the UK, nightclubs are being urged to monitor CO2 levels, and Ireland and Belgium are making monitors mandatory in places like hotels, restaurants and gyms, but confined spaces like cars are the worst culprits. So if you're travelling in someone else's car, like an Uber, you might want to wind down the back window and ask them to wind down a window in the front too. And if you're driving, check your aircon settings. Choose the fresh air mode instead of this recirculated air. If you'd rather not think about how much exhaled breath is all around you, don't worry, scientists are doing that on your behalf. It is uh, a little gross, but uh, that's the science that we're into. Because cleaning up infected air, something we can't even see, is a key tool in the combat of a very visible pandemic. Coming up, Delta's not the last mutation of COVID we'll see. Variants are going to come and go. Could the next one be even more dangerous? We could see worse than Delta yet. And can the vaccine keep up? I don't know whether that would be the same vaccine. It was big news when the world first hit one million COVID-19 cases. These days, four and a half million, almost New Zealand's entire population, catch it every week. The virus has killed that same number of people, four and a half million since the pandemic began. Last week alone, the global death toll was 68,000 people. Delta has only accelerated that. Since it was first identified in India last December, it has swept the globe to become the dominant variant in more than 100 countries. But there are now other variants on the horizon. Can the global vaccination effort keep up? Or are we facing an ever-present risk? The cars roll in. And the sleeves roll up. Delta's arrival has put the rush on. I wasn't really too fast or rushed to wanting to get vaccinated, but ever since this whole second lockdown, I'm just like, no, I need it. I need to come in and do it. The job looks monotonous. Tap, inject, plaster, repeat. But they don't find this work boring. When we're at medical school, all of those people that learnt about pandemics imagined it was something that wasn't going to happen in our lifetime. I guess the history books would tell us that it probably was going to happen in our lifetime. A pandemic that's far from over because the virus keeps mutating. The Delta strain has made a worldwide catastrophe much worse. The world watched in horror as bodies were piled in streets in India. Corpses burned in the most public of cremations. In New Zealand, 80 cases a day is a shock. But in the United States, new daily infections still exceed 150,000. Delta wasn't the first variant to make the world worry. It was Alpha and Beta and Gamma 2. And it won't end there, according to former Prime Minister Helen Clark, who examined the global response to COVID-19 for the World Health Organization. We could see variants that are more deadly and more transmissible than Delta is. There are already more variants of interest being monitored. Eta, Iota, Kappa and Lambda are spreading across the world right now. It's feared that Lambda, first found in Peru, could be more transmissible than the Delta variant. We know what Delta has done to many countries around the world. Should we now be worried about these new variants like Lambda that the WHO are looking at? We should be very concerned about what's to come if the world can't roll out vaccination much faster and if countries refuse to use all the public health measures at their disposal. Five billion vaccine doses have now been given out worldwide. It's now more than 190 days since the first COVID-19 vaccine was administered in New Zealand. But by the time we entered the latest level four lockdown, less than 20% of eligible Kiwis had received both jabs, which begs the question, have we been going too slow? I think we were quite slow in getting some of those strategies like the drive-throughs, I guess, planned and organized. Vaccinologist Helen Petusis harris has watched our rollout closely. With as many as 80,000 doses a day last week, you might think there's no hesitation from Kiwis. 
but it is a touchy subject for some families. So I've got two older children in their 30s that they just refuse to have it. I've talked to them how there's so many countries that are poor that can't have it done, and I, I hopefully they'll do it. You've seen hesitation from, from some people. The question is, how safe are these vaccines really? If I had a dollar for every time somebody had, um, had said that, you know, it's been, it's been rushed and that concept creates ideas that maybe we missed important stages in its development, but that's not the case. Um, there were no steps missed. Traditional vaccines used weakened virus to help your body build immunity. But the Pfizer vaccine uses a relatively new technology called messenger RNA. The vaccine doesn't contain the virus itself, but instead delivers a genetic code for a crucial part of the virus called the spike proteins. When you've been injected, your body starts making harmless spike proteins, which teach your immune system how to fight COVID-19. mRNA's big benefit is that as soon as scientists can map the genetic code of a new variant, they can edit the vaccine recipe to combat it. Variants are gonna come and go, but our data suggests there's at least some cause uh, to expect that the vaccines will continue to be reasonably effective. Some countries are already ordering booster shots. And later next year, these Kiwis could find themselves back in the queue. But I don't know whether that would be the same vaccine, whether we'll be using different vaccines made with different platforms, or whether we'll be using vaccines that are a reform, you know, different formulations that target perhaps different variants. But booster shots pose an ethical question. Should rich Western nations be ordering them when poorer nations still haven't got their first doses? We are all globally at huge risk. Because it's among the unvaccinated that the next deadly COVID strain will surface. Coming up, Britain is opening up. And you can now go to the theatre like normal. They'll just scan it and go in, yeah. But is freedom really free? We're currently in a situation where we have the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every three days. And is this our future? How many more level four lockdowns are you willing to put the country through? I don't want any more. I don't, no one wants them. There may be a massive effort to get vaccinated right now, but so far less than a quarter of eligible New Zealanders have had both doses. Compare that to places like the UK, where four out of five people over the age of 18 are fully vaccinated. Here in Aotearoa, our long-time COVID-free status meant we didn't need to rush. The UK has had a head start on the rest of the world. They are opening up and starting to give back to a new normal. They are in many ways the guinea pigs for living with COVID. But is it really working? It might just be the ultimate magic trick, the United Kingdom employing the art of distraction with a whole lot of look over there. On the right hand side, look down each way. And at first glance, it's working with no COVID scars in plain sight. It's been 577 days since the UK could last say they had zero cases. But they are back to zero restrictions. A country charging ahead with a hastily drawn roadmap for a world post-pandemic. There are people everywhere and there are very few masks. Just look at the crowds just here. And this is after around 30,000 new cases yesterday and today, and on average 100 deaths every day. Coming from New Zealand, it is an incredibly strange world to be living in. But here on a bus filled with residents of COVID-ravaged nations, I am the odd one out. Uh, I don't know if the lockdown is really uh, important for uh, solve the problem. The Ferravanti family are visiting from Rome. They only needed proof of their vaccinations and negative test results to get here. That's pretty easy. <laughs> yes. But is easy right? What cost has this newfound freedom come at? What toll is it still taking? And is it even really freedom? So the idea of freedom in the United Kingdom at, the pre at present is really an illusion. Epidemiologist Martin McKee says, if anything, it's an admission of failure. We're currently in a situation where we have the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every three days, 147 deaths yesterday. Do you really want that? 
that's the illusion, because you never really move on from COVID. This is the reality. It starts with a crash course in DIY science. This is the test itself. Sarah Lee from West Auckland is a warden at a student residence in London. Around five times. And this is just normal life for you now? This is normal life twice a week. Like everyone um, here, she has to return regular lateral flow COVID tests to gain entry. Goes down into this little spot here. The result is revealed within minutes. You can see that the little line is just appearing under C. That means that's a negative test. Good news. Fantastic news. And with that, she can go to work at her office at the university for the very first time since November. So how weird is it? It's so weird. While you might be growing tired of working from home after two weeks in lockdown in New Zealand, spare a thought for Kiwis here, where it's still largely the norm. But this is busier than it's been for months and months and months. So you get the sense it's starting up again? It started up again, but not back to the same, uh, not back to the same level. When it comes to their comeback, there is one thing Brits can boast above Kiwis. Are you vaccinated? Yes, we are. Right. All double dosed. Double dose? Double dose. More than 77% are double dosed, and it's allowing the luxury of international travel. Among those who used the vaccine passport to flee England this summer... This is so strange being in your shop while you're in Spain. I know. Co-founder of Kiwi jewellery brand Zoe and Morgan, Ruth Sibbald. Welcome to this crazy <laughs> world. Having stores in both England and New Zealand puts them in a unique position when it comes to comparing approaches. You have to look at business and community in a whole and you just can't bring everything to a standstill long term. But opening up in a COVID world comes with new challenges. In recent months, Britain found itself in the grips of a so-called pingdemic. That was a huge issue. People who have been at locations of interest are pinged by the app and told to isolate. That might sound familiar to people in Auckland at the moment. Which of your business branches then, the New Zealand side or this side, are faring better? New Zealand is still faring better. Faring better, but living with too much fear. It takes a mental shift and an acceptance. You're the odd one out if you haven't had COVID. Pretty much. I know, I think, one person that hasn't had it. Everyone seems to say that here. And look at this. Just minutes after a five-month high in COVID deaths was announced, and it's still happy hour. Pubs pumping, the West End open. Encourage you to wear your mask. Theatre goers with COVID test results at the ready. Yeah, I just did it last night. And showing vaccination certificates like their ID cards. And you can now go to the theatre like normal. They'll just scan it and then go in, yeah. Cases here are back on the rise. And they're expected to boom when millions return to school and work this week. Even still, there is the overwhelming feeling here that while people aren't happy with how things have gone, things are now too far gone for them to be able to do anything about it. And really, people are just doing their best to get on with their lives. And if you ask a Brit what their advice for New Zealand is, they'll tell you. Learn from our mistakes while there's still time. Coming up, the world marvelled at our COVID strategy once. The gloss has worn off. A case of COVID has shut down the entire country. Is this the last lockdown we'll face? It feels like a massive kick in the guts every time. So what's the way out of this? The virus will keep sneaking in and we may not be able to stamp it out completely. The world watched on in wonder last year as New Zealand eliminated COVID-19. As our friends and family overseas spent months locked up at home, we lived in freedom, packing out stadiums to watch the footy or enjoying concerts. Apart from being unable to travel overseas, life was pretty normal. But now much of the world is learning to live with the virus and our elimination strategy is being very publicly questioned. So is this it, an endless cycle of lockdowns? Or is there a way out? Behind the apocalyptic scenes we've become so familiar with are the stories of lost lives and lost livelihoods. Until enough of us are vaccinated, locking down is our best defence against Delta, the only meaningful control we have to pull off our elimination strategy, a strategy the Prime Minister is steadfastly sticking with. 
our number one strategy right now is the elimination strategy. It's the best strategy that has worked for us before. Elimination is the goal. Delta has made that goal decidedly more difficult. What started with a single case has spawned hundreds. We have far more locations of interest, tens of thousands of contacts, including me. Tova. Usually during a national crisis, I spend my days here. But this time I'm here, stuck at home in isolation. I was on the same flight as a case, and although that's considered a low risk exposure, with Delta it means out for 14 days. So now I'm catching up on some of the working from home basics that most Kiwis mastered last level four. How's it now? It's all good, eh? Marvelling at the wonders of Zoom. You come in and out a little bit. While enjoying some of the benefits of working from home. I'm sorry about your isolation situation. A small inconvenience for me, but absolutely nothing compared to those devastating, life-altering consequences of lockdown faced by so many. Some of the most devastating letters I have received in my life were after that first lockdown. Letters now being written again. Every time there's been a call to me to say we have a case, it, it feels like a massive kick in the guts. Every time, you know, it floors me because I know uh, that what we have to do, we just have to move and get it done. Getting it done with Delta meant the sharpest, most severe move up alert levels yet. And just as hard and early as our lockdown came, in flooded the international ridicule and condemnation of our nation. Our elimination pandemic strategy called into doubt. Our poor Prime Minister trapped in her arrogant zero COVID policy. Now what she's done just, to me, strains credulity. A case of COVID has shut down the entire country. It's not just right-wing media, but politicians too. That's just absurd. I mean, New Zealand can't do that. They were following an elimination strategy. They're in lockdown. Do you have any niggling doubt that you got this wrong? No. Earlier, less transmissible strains of the virus meant it could be beaten with lower alert levels, but that's not enough for Delta's dangerous speed. Dr Simon Clark is a microbiologist from Reading University and says once Delta's in, elimination can't work. The philosophy of keeping infections down to as near to zero is one that's probably going to have to be abandoned now. Look, people have always told us that we haven't been able to do what we've done. We've changed because of Delta, we've gone much harder because of Delta, and we remain committed because of our experts' view uh, to this strategy. The key expert, the man driving the government's strategy, is the venerable Professor Sir David Skegg. New Zealand forged its own path for dealing with COVID-19, and it's been brilliantly successful. Elimination does not mean eradication, and it doesn't mean zero COVID. But we're convinced this remains the best strategy as we get people vaccinated. And although better vaccinated countries like the US and UK have eschewed elimination and have started opening up, as they like to say, learning to live with the virus, Sir David says we're still doing better. We still have options. Why would we want to copy countries that have made such a hash of things over the last 18 months? But we've said that our strategy should be reviewed regularly and the emergence of Delta will certainly force us to do that. A bit like COVID mutating, think of the elimination strategy as an evolving response, where lockdowns are eventually a last resort replaced by public health measures like masks and social distancing. When we start reopening to the world next year, as we must, the virus will keep sneaking in and we may not be able to stamp it out completely. That will make life much more difficult. The best thing we can do to protect our health and our lifestyle is for everyone to get vaccinated. The shift away from lockdowns isn't possible without maximum vaccination and the rollout hasn't been gold standard. One of the worst public policy failures that I can ever recall that has led to us ending up in a level four lockdown for the country with no particular plan to get us out of it. This year is our year of the vaccine and then in the first quarter of next year, we'll then consider when we're ready to move into those next steps. So you might say no more level four lockdowns after the first quarter of next year? Our, our goal is to get rid of the need for those as soon as we can. How many more level four lockdowns are you willing to put the country through? I don't want any more. I don't, no one wants them. 
It keeps her up at night. Look to the Beehive before any lockdown decision is announced and the Prime Minister's ninth floor offices burn bright well into the night. But you're also not ruling out future level four lockdowns. Oh, I don't want to be in this one. I, I've never wanted to be in a lockdown situation. I can't predict what Delta is going to do. I can't predict what COVID is going to do, but I have a pretty good sense of New Zealanders' determination. There's little doubt among scientists that living with COVID will be our future. It will become endemic like many other viruses that spread among us, but until the world is sufficiently vaccinated, COVID-19 will still be classed as a pandemic. More variants like Delta will come. It's not over yet.